I'd like to call the village board meeting to order. If you'd stand for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, welcome everyone and welcome everyone watching at home tonight. Madam Clerk, call the roll. Trustee Carter. Present. Trustee Mariscal. Present. Trustee Kazam. Present. Trustee Gett. Present. Trustee Weisenberg. Present. Trustee DeVore. Present. Okay, good to see everyone. No one missing. We would be at item four, approval of the minutes from the Board of Trustees meeting on November 19th, 2019. I'd ask for a motion to approve the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I have, a, I have a motion to second. Any questions or corrections to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, um, under announcements, uh, just want to let everyone know that there's another newsletter coming out in January, and um, so look for that. Want to thank uh, the village staff for making the Heights Christmas celebration and all the events here uh, a success, and wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And next, a couple of pieces of business. Catherine Fife and Anyone from Express, come forward. Oh, hi, Sydney. Come on over here. All right, you want to tell us who you are? Oh, I'm uh, Cindy Neal from Express Employment Professionals down the street in the 4100 block. And I own Express Employment Professionals, and we've just celebrated our 30th year in business. 15 yeah. here in the Heights, so Good thrilled job. to be here. And Catherine Fife. I'm Catherine Fife. I'm the office coordinator with uh, Cindy down at Express, and uh, looking forward to hopefully 15 uh, years with me in business in the Heights. That's very good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here tonight. We want to celebrate with them their 30 years, and we had a proclamation. So, whereas the Peoria Express Employment Professionals Office celebrated its 30-year anniversary on October 27, 2019, according to owner Cindy Neal, whereas the Express Office opened October 27, 1989, and has since provided businesses and job seekers with temporary and full-time staffing solutions in a variety of fields, including light industrial, clerical, professional, and technical. Whereas the Peoria Express Employment Professionals franchise began operations in 1989 and serves the Peoria, Tazewell, and Woodford counties with temporary help and direct hire employees in a variety of fields including administrative, industrial, technical, sales, marketing, and more. Whereas Express is on a mission to put a million people to work annually. In 2018, the company generated $3.56 in sales and employed a record 566,000 people. Be it therefore resolved, the Village of Peoria Heights Board of Trustees hereby congratulates the Peoria Express, Express Employment Professionals for their 30 years of business in the Village and expresses sincere gratitude for their contribution to the community. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Stevenson, will you come up, please? Kathy served on our ZBA for at least 10 years, maybe 10 or 11 years, and helped leading the village through an, an awful lot of change. As you know, there's a lot happening in the Heights that's contributed to the workload of the ZBA, and she's um, helped us uh, in so many ways, and uh, such a, a dedicated, um, citizen here in the village. Uh, she's um, resigning her post, the ZBA, effective at the end of the month. Uh, we know she's going to stay active in the Heights, but because due to some travels, you're not able to serve in the capacity you were in the past. So we want to recognize Kathy for her service, and I just drafted a letter to her, and it says, Dear Kathy, I want to take a moment to thank you for your loyalty, dedication, time, and service on our Zoning Board of Appeals here in the village of Peoria Heights. Your input and efforts have been found very useful and also greatly appreciated as you were considered an integral part of our village team. 
Your expertise and dedication will be greatly missed. Wishing you the best in life and future ventures today and always. Um, it's, it's been a great experience. I've enjoyed it, working with the trustees, working with administration, and, and working with the community on different things. And I, I do intend to stay um, involved from the cheap seats going forward. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, next uh, we're going to have a presentation by the St. Thomas FLL Robo Comets for a handicapped accessible playground at Tower Park. Uh, Trustee Weisenberg and I met with this group, so Trustee, would you set this up for us, please? Sure. If we could have Mr. Kaiser come up. Uh, him and his team from St. Thomas are here to present an exciting project idea to bring a universally accessible park to Tower Park. Yeah, so really quickly, I'll introduce this. So First Lego League is known for mainly robots and, and programming robots to accomplish a task. But one of the main, one of the big parts of the, the uh, uh, overall program also is a research project. This year's program or theme was City Shaper. So the team was encouraged to look around their community and find a gap in the community that um, needs to be that they thought needed to be addressed and and so uh, the team here you guys may want to can you present maybe from like this side so that everybody could see yeah so yeah it, go over yeah exactly good good yeah so their um, the project then that they identified to work on is um, accessible parks so I'll let them go ahead they'll start with the skit this is the skit they presented at the competition last week um, it kind of explains then why uh, this is uh, an important thing for us to think about
So I'm going to turn it over to Katie and she'll give a, a little bit more background. So I have some visual aids for you guys. These are the exact same packets, so if they meet in the middle, if you start noticing pictures that are the same, that's because they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just different uh, images of what the park could look like and what the equipment there could look like. So, hello, my name is Katie Kuby, and I'm a member of the St. Thomas RoboComets 2 LEGO Robotics team. There are very few accessible parks in the Peoria area, and only one to be exact. That park is located in East Peoria. That is pretty unfortunate, especially since there are 14,269 people with disabilities in Peoria County alone. So every year for LEG Robotics, each team has to compo compose a skit that uses all group members. You have to have a problem and a solution that go along with the topic from that year. This year was City Shapers. So in City Shapers, you have to come up with a problem that's happening locally and come up with a solution in it in your skit. So we were brainstorming ideas and then the idea of an accessible park came up. The problem that there are very few and there are very many people that could benefit from them. This, po this particular topic is really personal for me because I've actually had three foot surgeries in the past five months and for a number of those months I was on crutches and could not walk myself. So this was really important to me because I could help people that were like me for that amount of time. So, during our time, we wrote an article to the Peoria Heights Board of Trustees and we wrote an article for the Peoria Heights Magazine to get our word out about our new and in innovative idea. We got a response from Mr. Brandon Weisenberg and he told us about a little girl that happens to be in a wheelchair. Her brother does not have any physical, mental, sensory de disabilities and they went to Tower Park, our very own Tower Park, and she couldn't play on the park with him. He had to play alone, and she had to watch from afar. That just happened to be the exact same story that we had written for our script this year. So that was kind of our last confirmation that this was really important, and this is something that we needed to work with. Accessibility is really important because a lot of people can use it, and universal design includes everyone. Everyone can use it, no matter their disability, no matter their race, their age, their gender, anyone can use it. So that was really something that was super important to us. Um, we, our hope is to create a accessible park using universal design in our very own tower park. Um, it's a lot cheaper than starting from scratch, which is another reason why we really liked Tower Park, because it's already flat, it's already paved, it's conveniently located with lots of restaurants um, and different shopping places, so it's a really fun place to hang out. And there are lots of different musical festivals um, and different just fun things to do during the summer, so we thought that would be really great. And it's super close to our school, St. Thomas, which is also in Peoria Heights. So everything just kind of came together for Peoria Heights. These parks are so important because we can't learn how to act around people with disabilities if we aren't around them. And if, as kids, we're growing and developing and we need to learn that. And what better way to learn that than through play? Some place, an environment where most kids can be comfortable and can be themselves. And we thought that's just great to see, they can both see that yes, we're different, but we're still so alike and there's no reason for us to discriminate against each other and so this is really important for everyone. So our solution again is to get a our own accessible park in Tower Park and we hope that you guys can help us to do, to do that. Um, if you guys have any questions then. Board members any questions? It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we're going to work with you, so Trustee Weisenberg has agreed to be our point person on this. Uh, uh, Brandon, how do you see things unfolding? Just uh, we've, we've agreed to help, help you with fundraising, and uh, what else am I missing? Um, 
Did you have a chance to research costs related to the project? Um, accessible parks would be um, about 100,000 to 200,000, depending on obviously um, who we use for the equipment and um, obviously where we use it and how big the park is. Um, time, we don't have a for sure date on how long it would take because obviously it depends on how long it takes us to raise money. Um, and then obviously we have to make the equipment and put it in. But we think it'll be at least, we think it'll be at least by 2021. So, yeah. Are there companies that make this equipment already so we can, we're not creating it or, or a manufacturer isn't creating it special, specifically for us? There are actually a number of different places and we have help from different schools that would be willing to help us um, use their kind of ability to get into those places a little quicker so that we could get in quicker and possibly cheaper. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of open ideas for that. Great. Do you have an idea of which equipment pieces you want to put in already? Like, which things that you are, like, your most wanted? Um, we definitely want the swings that you can hook wheelchairs into because they're really big, so a wheelchair can go in, and anyone who just wants to swing in the swing can still close the um, ramp up and ride in that. We definitely want to get sort of musical instrument toys. They're um, on a wall type of equipment, and then kids with sensory impairments can um, play with them. Autism has become more common, and there are different button-type toys that we definitely think that would be something really interesting for um, a lot of people to still play with, so different things like that. Is there any kind of fundraisers that you guys are thinking about doing? Um, we were thinking of setting up a GoFundMe app that's really easy. You can put pictures in and people can either donate anonymous, anonymously or use their names. Um, our school has actually offered to set up a fundraiser and we have a lot of students that are ready to help and they're hands on. Uh, so our principal has already said yes, if this gets off the ground we would love to set up a fundraiser and help you guys. And then obviously we were ready to write some grants and see if we could get grants. Okay, great, thank you. And I know the Heights businesses um, have been very generous in the past um, for the Peoria Heights House League program. So I think it'd be worthwhile to make up a brochure and just go business to business asking for donations because they've been very generous in the past. So, Council, I'm thinking the, the board uh, should formally adopt this concept. So, at the, at the next departmental meeting, we uh, adopt something that uh, gives our go ahead on, on this project. Does that make sense? It, it sure does. Yep. Okay. All right. So, that'll be on the uh, agenda for the next departmental meeting, which will be the 7th, Madam Clerk, uh, of January? Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Chief. And we'll keep you on the email chain. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, best wishes in your project. Uh, we're going to be working with you every step of the way, including the fundraising. So uh, please keep us updated, though. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we would be at public comment. Public comments open. Hi, Kathy, welcome back. It was a short departure. <laughs> um, my name is Kathy Stevenson. I'm at 4536 North Miller Avenue in Peoria Heights, Illinois. And um, I wanted to make a couple comments regarding the uh, recreational cannabis ordinance that you're going to be um, voting on tonight. And I know there was, um, there was a lot of discussion in the zoning board um, about the distance, and I wanted to make a couple comments on that. Um, while I agree to some degree that um, the distance to an alcohol establishment versus a recreational cannabis could be the same, there are also some exceptions, I think. Um, cannabis is a state law versus alcohol would be federal. Um, the other thing, which kind of goes against alcohol being so close right now at only 100 feet, is that alcohol isn't consumed on the premises. And I think we need to be um, cognizant of the fact that most likely there is going to be a consumption um, ordinance at some point down the road when we did the medicinal cannabis ordinance. Um, we had talked about 
you know, would there be consumption? Would there be recreational? And it was, you know, not right now. Don't worry about it. Well, here we are a couple years later, and we're looking at recreational. So I'm pretty sure a couple years down the road, we're probably going to look at consumption ordinances as well. So I think whatever you adopt in terms of a distance, you need to make sure that you take that into consideration. Um, and then just in terms of um, the zoning board thought 500 feet, um, the actual um, medicinal ordinance is 1,000 feet. Um, I know there was some discussion uh, that it would go to the alcohol one, which is 100 feet. And just as a frame of reference, in terms of closeness or proximity to schools and churches, you guys are sitting about 130 feet from the front door of the church across the street. So that is not very big of a distance. Um, almost to the fact that it makes me think that maybe the alcohol should be a little bit different. Now, alcohol, again, is different if you serve food. So just keep that in, uh, in the back of your mind. But it's really, it's five parking spaces is all that 100 feet is. So I just, I just want to make sure that we're taking full consideration of that. Um, there was also some discussion about um, zoning B2 versus B1. And there's a lot of businesses that are allowed in B2 versus B1. And there's reasons for that. Um, that, and that's the whole reason behind zoning districts, that you have different zoning districts and, and the uses that are allowed within those. So um, one of the reasons, and I know there was some discussion amongst at, at your working session about the property values and how it would affect um, property values of homes on um, War Memorial Drive versus homes if you did it in the B1 district. And um, that was one of the things, reasons we thought 500 feet made sense, because if it was 500 feet from the school, it tended to protect a lot of the property values of businesses. Um, some of the businesses um, obviously took into account the proximity to the schools and churches, and then also to the um, homes as well. Um, and I think that's it on that. Um, but we do, as being a home rule um, municipality, anything that we do, we can actually be more stringent than whatever the state law is. So I think that's always something that we should be able to utilize. Um, the zoning that is in place, um, the ordinances that we come up with are really, and when I say we come up with, they're, they're very much derived from administration, and then the zoning board is kind of a first pass before it gets to you. Um, but they're, they're really intended to create the type of environment and the type of um, community that we want to have. So as you're thinking about changes, as you're approving different things, developments, ordinances, I think you need to keep that in mind, that we're really trying to create um, a certain environment. Um, and when I look at our downtown area, when we went through the whole reform based code, um, establishment at that time, part of it was we looked at the Peoria Heights and our downtown as being so vibrant, and that was kind of by accident. It was by accident because we didn't tear down the buildings. And because we didn't tear down those buildings, we have buildings that are very close in proximity that kind of facilitate a walkable community. And so that's the kind of thing, as, you, as we're making decisions and we're making future ordinances, it's really important that we don't do anything that deters from, um, from really what we've created by accident. So we don't want to accidentally put ordinances in place that deter from what we created. Um, so that's that on the cannabis. Um, a separate note, I just wanted to say that I'm really excited that we're going forward on a, a comprehensive plan. Um, I think it will address, we had, you know, with some of the residential development that we have right now, and we've struggled with that. Um, I think it's really important that that comprehensive plan, we get the community involved, we get residents involved, so that there's input into um, what that would look like. Um, based on previous planning processes that I've tried to be involved in within the Heights, they've really tried to cram it in really fast, and so getting to an outcome was more important than the quality of the outcome. So I think it's really important that it, there shouldn't be a date out there that's kind of a line in the sand. You need to make sure that you allow enough time because the better the input, the better the output. Um, and then lastly is just if, you're, if we're hiring consultants and spending the money, let's let them do their job. Um, when I've talked to some of the consultants that they presented things, many times I'll ask a question that's based on an, some kind of urban planning principle, and they'll say that they haven't, they didn't do it because they were instructed not to. They were given specific in, kind of encumbrances um, from the trustees. So I think it's important that we remove encumbrances. If you want the best outcome, you really need to not look for something that's going to 
justify maybe decisions we've made in the past or justify preconceived notions. It really should be trying to identify what are those decisions we need to make in the future to make um, the community as vibrant and sustainable as possible. So I would just encourage you to take the handcuffs off, let them do their job. You can always modify things, but if you don't have them come in with um, completely free of encumbrances, you don't always get the best information. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Still open? Hi, uh, Jimmy. Welcome. <coughs> Uh, I know most of you have heard me talk here before, but for the public audience that would be on TV that hasn't heard me talk, um, Jimmy Dillon, Associate Director of West Central Building Trades. And uh, before I even get into what I'm really here for is after watching that St. Thomas presentation, I would definitely say the future is bright. Um, if they're coming here being that well-spoken um, for that age to be talking about s parks and development and raising money and... Um, talking about GoFundMe, which, you know, when I was in school, no, well, it didn't even exist at that time. So to, to be where they were at was really impressive. Makes me feel, I've always felt good about the Peoria area, but to see that makes you feel even better. Um, but again, I want to come and thank the board for their leadership on getting to here tonight um, to put some, what you're doing tonight is valuing the worker as much as you value development. And that means the world to all the workers that we represent, which is 100 plus uh, people in Peoria Heights alone, not even counting the county and the surrounding counties, but 100 some families plus their families in Peoria Heights alone are represented by the union trades here. And what tonight does is values them and puts them to work in their own backyard. Um, I know most of you have heard me talk about the $15 million that we spend annually in the community um, at our training schools, which I'll set up the tours for that. I know I've been talking about that and we're looking at the first of the year, a little after, and that um, for those of the healthcare, you know, we spent over $80 million when you provide health care as an employment, that's over $80 million a year, that, in the, over, not $80 million, $80 million over the last five years that has gone back into the hospitals and the local economy. So tonight, I especially, especially appreciate Mayor Phelan and Trustee Kazam's leadership as a chair of this um, to bring this forward, and everybody on the village, Sarah, Brett, just Chief Sutton, everybody for doing this. Um, much appreciated on behalf of the workers. This is a very nice Christmas present, uh, valuing workers and putting them at just the top of with development. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, if not, I know this has been a long process of committee meetings to get here and other discussions. So uh, appreciate everything. Anyone else? Okay. Who's next? Clint. Well, well if, if uh, Jimmy or Clint, you want to tell us who you brought with us tonight and who they're representing, and, or, unless they want to do that themselves? Yeah. Thomas or Matt or? Matt Martell, Neighbors Local 165, President of the Village Trades. Tom Crowell, Local 18. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone. We're still in our public comments, so if anyone else wants to come up. Public comment going once, going twice. Public comments closed. We'll go on to trustee reports. The first is public works, Trustee Carter. Um, yeah, I'd like to have Dave come up. He's, we're going to talk about the water. Um, some people seem to think that they still have problems with water, so we're just going to clarify it, especially since we're videotaping it for the people at home. Yeah, so I talked at length last, me last meeting about the, the water quality and the issues and um, a lot about Facebook. I, uh, since this is being taped on YouTube, I wanted to, um, uh, I guess, uh, relay the importance if you have public works issues, whether it's street or water, please call the office. Um, we, we do not consider Facebook rants or comments on Facebook official 
complaints. So if you have an official concern or complaint, please call the water office or call the administration office and those will be handled accordingly. <clears throat> um, Dave, I don't mean to interrupt, but you gave a really good report at the last departmental meeting. I, tonight for everyone watching at home, could you just quickly summarize what you talked uh, about? And I know that's hard to do, but I, I would prefer not to. I mean, I give it a shot. <laughs> um, Especially about the, the, the water, you're going to get it. Yeah, we've had some water water issues lately, water quality um, concerns. There's been a few um, that have um, taken pictures on Facebook. Um, we are a, um, a groundwater facility. <clears throat> we get our water from groundwater wells, aquifers, which are known for high content of iron and manganese. Um, we don't filter that stuff out of our water. We um, treat it with phosphate. We don't, we treat, we don't filter. So it's still in the water, you just don't see it. Um, and sometime the sometimes the chemicals get, get wacky and things get out of, uh, out of whack and you may see it in, your, in, in, the, in the water. Um, there is no harm. Uh, we have our water tested daily. We have strict guidelines we have to follow by the Illinois EPA. Um, uh, we also, as far as the, that's as far as the village side. As far as the owner side, we have no control over water quality once it enters the property. There are several um, factors inside a business or a residence which could affect water quality, such as water heater, water softener, age of pipes, um, aerators on sinks. Um, so if you have brown or dirty water, that's why it's important to call the water office because we have a set of questions that we can ask you that will help determine whether it is an interior issue or if it is a village-wide system issue. If I get one phone call, that's gonna be an interior issue because we all get our water from the same water mains. I can't give somebody at house A clean water and somebody at house B dirty water. We all get our water from the same location. So if I have 200 complaints, 200 water heaters probably don't go bad all at once. That's, you know, that's probably a, a, a village issue. That's why it's important to call the water office. And like I said, village employees don't respond to Facebook comments. We don't respond to Facebook rants. So that's why it's important to call the water office. Um, uh, Trustee Weisenberg has asked us to put a question and answer um, information on the website. Emily and Stephanie are work on, working on that. And we'll help, hopefully have that up soon. That'll help. Uh, I know, but the younger generation, they're, they're, they're big on the, uh, on, you know, the internet or the social media, so that will help. They'll be allowed to get on the, on the website and maybe help, I guess, decipher if there's an issue on their end on their own without calling the water office. Although we do still recommend, please call us because yeah. you're our eyes and ears, and essentially yeah. that's oftentimes the first time we know about a problem is when somebody calls it. Yeah, we, we had a water main break last Thursday, and I found out via Cheryl Carter through Facebook. Yeah. And that, you know, that, that's important stuff that we need to know about immediately. You know, that needs to be called into the either the after hours number or the water office. So. Yeah, and I also make a comment. As much as long as it took that person to post it, take a picture and post it on Facebook, they could have called the office and you guys could have been there even quicker. Yeah. Um, so I really encourage <clears throat> call, call in. If you want to post it, post it, but make sure you call in first. I mean, that, that's priority. Call our office, no matter if, it, if it's street or water, even yeah, things, anything. I even see where people are post on, you know, that they saw somebody walking down the street. Well, Call the police. That's what they're there for. That's what we pay them to do, is to get a call, they'll go check it out. I can't imagine anybody complaining that, you know, we get too many calls because they're all fake calls. We don't, we don't have that. We encourage people to call our office. Yeah, our, um, our water is not perfect. 98% of the time, it's going to be clear. There's going to be that 2% that it's going to be, it could be brown, it's not harmless, but... Um, we take pride in our customer service. We have very good customer service. If, if you call the water office, you're going to get attention, and you're going to get it right away. If you post it on Facebook, you're not getting attention from me. You're not getting attention from Emily. You're not getting attention from Zara, from Chief Sutton. You're not getting attention from anybody. So that's why it's important to call the, the office. Dave, can you touch base on the safety of the water? 
I know we talked about that last week about even though it's colored, like. Yeah, uh, we have, like I said before, we have to uh, submit monthly samples to the EPA, and uh, those samples include our five raw water wells. And what raw water is is untreated water. So our water, when it comes out of the well or comes out of the aquifer, is they test that to make sure it's safe monthly. So even without the chemicals, um, I could provide, or we could provide our citizens water straight from the aquifer, and it would be safe to drink. Uh, iron and manganese content is not currently uh, guideline by the EPA. There's there's no requirements. They 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 require you to sample it just for um, test for. I guess for bookkeeping reasons or for record keeping, but as far as like enforcing limits on it, they, there is no um, limits or regulations. Dave, does that water, be, if, it, if there is a problem on the customer side, I'm just questioning, and, and they're taking pictures of the brown water or, or whatever, and it is on their side, is it then become dangerous for them at that time if something inside their house is causing it? Um, I honestly can't answer that. I don't know. I'm not. A, I'm not really an um, expert on water softeners or water heaters. I, I would think not. But I, I would, with with gas being involved, or you know, I, I don't. I don't. Know. I can't answer that honestly. <clears throat> I cannot answer. That'd be more of a question for a plumber. And that's what we. We advise people when they when we suspect it's a water heater, you need to call a professional. We're not we're not plumbers. I don't claim to be one. We we advise you to call a professional plumber, and that's a question that they could definitely answer. Okay. I would lean to say no, but I I wouldn't uh, put my head on that. So, so one question I have, or actually several concerns, <clears throat> is it always seems to be the same issue, not the same person, but always the same issue. So I have a hard time thinking that all these people have a bad water heater <coughs> or bad pipes because I could see if it was an issue that was different each time someone posted on Facebook or ranted but it's always the same issue and, and what, did, what are the pictures usually of a, a tub of water tub some people right. show like a um, coffee maker um, some people complain about um, ruining those I don't know, those German coffee makers um, or those being discolored um, but it, it just seems weird that it's so many people well I disagree we have 2700 customers and I, I mean it, to me, I mean, what's considered a lot when you have four people that complain that out of 2700 like I said it's not perfect um, 98 percent of the time it's gonna be it's gonna be perfect there's that two percent and I and I get it I mean it's it uh, when you have brown water it, it stinks but like I spoke at the last meeting if we want to make it perfect let's do it we, we need um, four or five million dollars we'll get filtration plants in here that's you know right that's why we encourage water softeners you know um, I know that not everybody can afford a water softener but that you know that, that's one of the uh, remedies that they can take at home right I'm not, I'm not placing any blame. I just, there's a lot of frustration that's been aired to me that every time they call in about it, their pipes are blamed. No, that's false. Well, I mean, I feel like last time we talked about, like, we took the blame that sometimes it, it does come brown, but if we treat it, we still have to go through how many hundred gallons before that treatment makes yeah. it to someone's house, 500, you know, that's a lot that has to, we have to pump through before yeah. we're getting new treated water. Yeah, the, the, we have two million gallons of water in the air. And that stuff has to go in the system for the new stuff. After I adjust the chemicals, that's got to go in, and then that's, that's got to be the, the only way to go through water quicker is to flush hydrants every you know, every time that happens, and that, that we don't want to. So speaking on the recent incident, so those <coughs> residents who had brown water, it likely wasn't their internal plumbing. It was the water that we had in the tanks that just had to cycle through. Um, the, the one lady, she told me it was her hot water, and her cold water was fine. We don't supply hot water to, we don't have hot water tanks. That tells me that your hot water heater's gone bad. Um, that's why we have a set of questions that we have to ask. If it's your cold water and your hot water, then obviously the hot water heater's been eliminated. And we, then we ask, do you have a water softener? Can you bypass the water softener? So we're not, uh, we're not immediately going to the it's your problem. These are questions that we ask. And if the questions line up, then we say, you may have something interior. Ask your neighbor. 
like I said, we all get our water mains. We all get our water from the same water mains. It, it's impossible for me to to give you dirty water and give your neighbor clean water. If you have dirty water, your neighbor should have dirty water. Right. Does that make sense? No, it makes yeah. perfect sense. Well, some people don't want to. They call. They don't want to hear. Right. It might be there. They want you to. If it, if it involves money, money you, you or effort, they don't want. They don't want to hear that. They, they, they want. You can't just come and yeah. wave a wand and you're fixed. It, but uh, it, it's it's safe. To... It's safe, clean water. And like I said, there, there's times where it's not, and it's it's not done, you know, mischievously. It's you know, it's just it's it, it happens. Like I told you last time, there's a lot of things that affects it. Temperature, um, the aquifer. You know, so it it is what it is. I, I wish these people. Today we had zero complaints, and last night there was. I was told there was banter on Facebook with pictures and stuff, and I, no one called. And so, so to me, there was zero complaints. You know. yeah. And I've talked to the mayor about this, and I know families, a certain family, and I won't mention a name, who've lived here for probably 30 years and raised family, and they've told me that they do not drink the water because of the quality of the water. So it's not just, I worry that we're not capturing complaints. Why we're not capturing complaints, I have no idea. I don't know why people don't call. I don't know why people don't show up to the meetings. But there are families in the Heights that have lived there a long time that all have the same opinion. So that, that's kind of my concern. I want to, one, dis, dispense of that you know, rumor or myth that the water is bad. No, how do we do that? Um, and how do we get more people to actually call it so we can capture this? Data? Yeah, and there, there are several ways that you can, uh, they can get online and verify that our water is safe. Our, our last EPA violation was 2006. I'm proud of that. That's before I got here. Um, you can go on Drinking Water Watch. You can Google Drinking Water Watch, and you can know anything. You can see anything and everything about uh, about our water company, about our samples. I mean, you can call PDC. You can take samples out there. Yeah. Well, in the day and age of bottled water, you're not going to get the same taste out of your faucet that you're going to get it from bottled water as you've gone to the store and bought that's been treated. I mean, yeah. go, go, out, go out in the country and get, get one straight from the well. You want to talk about something that don't taste too great, especially uh, over around Tremont with the sulfur content. They, well, they, the just, they, they, they taste the, the minerals <clears throat> and stuff in the water and they think it's not safe and it's bad. No, no. They're just, there's nothing wrong with the water. Yeah, I, I know people who drink it every day, and I know people who. Well, who we did win an award so. last year from a state organization yeah. recognizing that. Yeah. 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 And I'll say this again because we're recorded. Um, I do find a lot of comfort that you live in the Heights, you drink the water. Every morning. And I, I don't think it's an issue, uh, like an employee issue, or it's not yeah, being done right. I understand that. I just know there's a lot of people out there that for some reason do not like the water. Well, if we're aware of it, we'll be there the next day investigating yeah, at, yeah. at the property. So yeah, and that's sure I mean, that. I'll come out to your house and and show me. You know, I'm, I have no. Our doors are open. I have no problem. I I, yeah, I, I will discuss media. this all day, every day. Social so. media is a double-edged sword. It, it brings a lot of people together and also. No comment. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. I, and I got one question real quickly for Trustee Carter. Yes. The reference regarding the water break was that the St. Jude incident? Yeah. Okay. How early is someone here answering the phone? Because that was a pretty early water break. <laughs> Office opens at eight o'clock, and if you call after hours, there's a message that re refers you to the Peoria dispatcher who can get a hold of the on-call person immediately. Is that that message is on there, right, Stephanie? It tells you to contact the. I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't call our number. <laughs> yeah, it, it should stay on there, and I'll have Emily check tomorrow. But it should yes. say if you have an after-hours emergency to contact the the dispatcher's number, and then. Yep, we have we have on call 24 hours a day, yeah. seven yeah, days a week. Up. She wouldn't have changed that. That's the way it's set up. All right. Anything else under public works, Trustee Carter? Mike. Mike. Now I'll get on the water too. I've been here a long time. Um, if you ever have dirty water, take a white bowl out to your spigot where you hook your hose up. Let it run for a while. Put something in the white bowl. If it's not dirty, then it's interior. It's got to be something in the house. Do usually your spigot's hooked before your, or it's after the water meter, but that's where you're getting your freshest water out of. And that's going to tell you it's internal or water softener or what have you. But uh, 
The other thing I was going to tell Dave that they got water tablets now if you think you got a leak. But I'm up here to talk about snow. So I was going to give you a little scenario real quick about a snow removal that we just done. We didn't have any complaints. I had one about leaves, but nothing else about the snow. Uh, there's people asking me questions on how we do it in different areas. We didn't get on the secondaries and stuff. Usually we take care of the mains so we can get emergency equipment to your house. We get to secondaries when the snow starts to slow down, we call the rest of the guys in. So we wrapped up, uh, I think Chris and them came in about 6, and uh, we wrapped up about 3 o'clock in the morning. Everything, alleys and everything were done. So Good I'm job. kind of proud of them, yeah. yeah. And the, one more of the water things, someone texted me or sent me the picture at 7.49 a.m. that morning. It was, uh, I won't say the name, but that's how it all got started about the water, water main break. Yeah, so. I think Chris was there yeah. like at 8, yeah, 14. Chris, mm -hmm. Yeah. Went down so, there. But yeah. yeah, someone said that to me, but I don't look at my, you know, I don't right. look at that all day long. Right. So, but the water office opened at 8, but they still could have called for the recording, like Stephanie had said. So, but just real, you know, just real quick, the snow and this one other thing. If you're out shoveling, shovel it downstream. When we plow, we hate to plow your driveway. We, I plow my own in, you know, usually. So just make sure you, you shovel it. And if you can do the sidewalks, we're really proud of that too. So, but if any complaints, you can call me anytime. I'll, I'll come out and talk to you. So, yeah. thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Good job on the snow. Anything else, Trustee Carter? Yep. Okay, we'll move on to building and property maintenance. Trustee Mariscal, do you have anything? Um, I did get an email from um, Chief Sutton regarding the boiler that we've been talking about. Um, I guess last Friday they had an emergency maintenance call on the boiler that we currently have. Um, and it looks like um, they've con <coughs> Chief Sutton, have you contacted like four different companies for quotes and we've only received one as of today. <coughs> and, um, so he's recommending that we move forward with the replacement um, since the repair that was done last week would only be short term. Um, he also did tell me this is a TIF eligible expense. Um, and again, uh, talking to Stephanie, um, we don't really we don't have enough money in there to cover that, but apparently <clears throat> um, at some point we would get paid back. Um, through the TIF money. Don't know how long that would take, but I'm assuming we're looking around still 30000 Correct. Uh, the first quote we received was in that ballpark, and I should have the other two or three by the end of the week. Um, this emergency maintenance we had uh, last Friday, uh, we obviously had to close Village Hall at 2 o'clock because of it was it was not just a, a short fix. I mean, they had to actually take the, take the unit apart and do some welding, and it filled Village Hall with smoke. So we we closed Village Hall. Um, I think they wrapped up around eight o'clock Friday night. Uh, but again, it's just a a band aid fix. Uh, I think that once we get these quotes, we need to move forward. Um, we will have to pay this up front, obviously, but it is a TIF eligible expense. Uh, eventually, the village will see reimbursement once uh, there's enough increment in that in that fund. So. Um, Hope to have the quotes in the end of the week, and then I will bring uh, those to the board. And we need to move on it because I'm not really sure how this, how long this is going to last. So, and by the way, rural does our service work. We're very happy with them. They do, did an excellent job, and they've worked with us. But uh, because of the cost of this, we want to make sure we get some other quotes on this. Anything else, Trustee Mariscal? So, where are we going to pull this money from then until we get the money back? I'm assuming you're not going to take the remaining amount that's in TIF 3 out and put that balance down no, to zero. We, the village will pay for this. And this is coming out of general. Yes. So work. typically what happens with TIF expenses are they're booked against TIF, but the funds are paid out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. And then there's a separate liability line item that I increase basically saying, OK, it's an IOU line item that says, OK, pay back this amount now. So we'll do that. OK. Right, anything else? Nope, that's Okay, on to economic and community development. Trustee Kazam. Yes, I have two things to report. Um, just to bring people up to date, I attended the second open meeting of the Riverview Development Coalition last night in Chillicothe at Shore Acres. 
And I know I've spoken to some of the trustees um, and other forums, but for the public, this is a coalition that's being developed um, between the McCluggage Bridge and Lakin um, to encourage economic and agri and, hist and historic tourism in the area. And the exciting announcement um, right now is that we will be participating in the website for the scenic byways and the Nature Conservancy um, that will help promote tourism in our area, both to pardon me, Peoria Heights and also the surrounding areas. So they get about a half a million hits a year for people wanting to travel to the area for all kinds of things, camping, hunting, um, bird watching, that type of thing. So that'll be a great way to promote our area. And then secondly, I just wanted to, this I guess maybe I could have um, read in, um, announcements, but um, Barry Cloyd and the Betty Jane Brimmer um, facility are starting a new thing called the Heart of the Song, which is an acoustic original um, group. It will be three people um, and they are, the first one is on March 6th. So it's Barry Cloyd, Chris Stevens, and Robin Crow, I believe. So if anyone mm -hmm. wants to attend that, I wanted to announce it. I think it's really innovative. And, uh, and really thank important. you, Trustee Kazam. If I may chime in on another community event that um, I attended Sunday, the KDB group made a significant donation to the uh, kitchen at St. Thomas. So um, there were quite a few families served on Sunday a dinner, and this can evolve into a really nice community center for, for people in, in the Heights area to help everything from wellness to resumes to um, dress for success, but uh, starting out um, helping feed people in need, not only people who are in need, but people who may be um, a senior citizen just don't have anywhere else to go. So uh, thanks to that group that, that did that, and uh, we're going to be getting a report from them in the future. Thank you. Any questions on Trustee Kazam's report? Okay. We'll move on to administration. Trustee Get. Uh, yes, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Chief Sutton has informed me that the evaluations for the non-union employees were was completed last week and we're all ready to go. Union employees, all employees. All, union, okay, all, all employees. So that's been taken care of as of last week. That's all. Any, okay, anything, Dustin? Uh, I think that uh, the update I had on the server update in Grandview Terrace fire coverage, Trusty Weisenberg is going to cover, so that's all I have. Okay. All right, on to fire. Trusty Weisenberg. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor. We are continuing to work on um, revising the server quote um, for the fire department in the village of Peoria Heights. Uh, we should have an update on that on the next uh, administrative board meeting in January. And Dave, did you want to come up and talk yeah, about the... So we have some updates regarding the lack of the fire coverage on Grandview Terrace. Um, we did have a meeting that I missed because I was sick, but um, Dave is going to give us a quick update. Yeah, so Chief Sutton, uh, Chief Walters and I met um, once to come up with some ideas um, for the fire protection on Grandview Terrace. Um, Chief Walters came up with a, to me, a fantastic idea um, that's going to be uh, probably the least expensive. Um, we had a meeting yesterday with an uh, engineer from our Stutz. <clears throat> Once the um, snow melts, he's going to go down and actually put eyes on the area and then come up with a plan on paper with a, uh, with a cost. I think it's going to be really inexpensive, um, but we're not going to put a cost on it until he actually puts eyes on it and um, can put it on paper. Um, so I hope uh, by early next month or middle of next month we can have something actually on paper and have the idea um, out in front of you. I'm, I won't bore you with it now because it's I will confuse you all. So we'll get it all on paper and then we'll come back to you next month hopefully. Did you say inexpensive or expensive? Inexpensive. inexpensive. Yeah, it it, uh, it it'll be it should be really inexpensive. Yeah, it, uh, it it won't be a perfect solution, but it'll be better than what they have now. Um, and it and today it's the it's the greatest idea I've heard. So kudos to Chief Walters for coming up with it. 
and we completed an annual um, equipment test that's required um, by the state of Illinois. Um, we need to replace two steel cables on the big ladder truck that are starting to wear. Um, we don't have a cost yet for that, um, but it isn't expected to be much and should fit within the uh, maintenance uh, line item for the department. And that's all I got. Okay. Questions? All right, police, Trustee DeVore. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone at home that here in the village we do not allow solicitors without a permit. So if you are seeing people solicit in your neighborhood, please ask them to see a permit. If they do not, you can tell them or you can call the police station and let them know they cannot solicit without a permit. And we also do not allow panhandling. So if you're approached with anybody that is panhandling, please call the police department so that we can get this taken care of right away. We don't, we don't want that going on here. So just to update everyone on that. And that's all. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, on to old business. Any old business come for the board? Hearing none, we'll go right into new business. The first is uh, the appointment of Charlie Calloway to the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd ask for a motion to approve. So move. Do I have a second? A second. second. Charlie, I thought it was, there you are. Uh, you want to come up? Just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for your offer to serve. My name is Charlie Calloway. I live at 4917 North Grandview Drive. I've been a uh, Peoria resident for my entire life, uh, except for three days in Champaign when I, where I was born. Um, I, have, uh, I went to school at St. Thomas. I've been uh, living in Peoria Heights for the last eight years. I've had my business in Peoria Heights, um, and I look forward to serving on the zoning board. Uh, I guess uh, just to let you know a little bit more about myself, I do uh, own a marketing firm here in town. I employ about 25 uh, individuals, uh, 12 full-time, 12 part-time, and uh, that's about it. Thank you. Yep. Uh, just to let everyone know, I, I meet with, when these appointments come open, I meet with uh, Chairman Rick Pitzel, the ZBA, and, and we, we met, and uh, this was his recommendation, and you offer to serve. I'm grateful for your willingness. Yeah, no, I, Kathy, uh, I, I know hope I've, you don't mind helping out Charlie a little bit. I've got okay. some big shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy has uh, done a phenomenal job in just uh, being a part of this tonight and last night and seeing uh, her contributions. Uh, I know I definitely have some, some uh, shoes to fill. I am excited uh, with everything that's going on in the Heights to be a part of what's happening here. So I look forward to serving and I look forward to working with the Board of Trustees as that happens and occurs and I uh, look forward to the first meeting in February. Okay, we got a motion, a second. Any discussion on the motion? All right, Madam Clerk, call the roll. Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazan? Aye. Trustee Gett? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. Okay, congratulations. Next is approval of Ordinance 2019-1615, an ordinance requiring payment of prevailing wage for all projects involving use of village tax increment financing funds and business development district funds. Trustee Kazan would ask for a motion to approve. I make a motion to approve this ordinance. Do we have a second? Second. Trustee Kazam, go ahead. Um, well, as we all know, there's been a lot of discussion about this issue, and um, I don't know if anyone has any questions this evening. They're welcome to ask them. We have people, members in the audience, to answer any other questions. But this is a ordinance that would require um, prevailing wage for anyone who asks for BDD funds or TIF funds from the municipality. I have questions. Okay, okay. go for it. So. <laughs> Correct. This is not only a prevailing wage, but because of the language, this covers responsible bidder for BDD funds, yes? Correct. And and the reason we didn't use the, the, the term bidder, um, it, bids are required when the village is hiring out work, um, so, so it would be a public works project. The, the, the drive of this ordinance is the private developers that ask the village for funding, either through the TIF or through the BDD. Um, so they're not... The private developers are not obligated to solicit bids the same way the village would be if it was street resurfacing or sewer project. Um, so the term bidder does not appear in there. Um, but section three, you'll notice, was added since the last time we reviewed this ordinance. 
and it requires the same hiring of contractors that can document that they're participating in inappropriate job training programs, the same as um, a responsible bidder ordinance that, that would have applied to the village. So Recognized by the Department of Labor, correct? Exactly, exactly. Okay, question two. So since this is going to be for business, for BDD and TIF funds, do we, does this overlap into us as a village adopting responsible bidder for anything that we do? That would be a different matter. This is addressed only to private developers that, that are asking for TIF or BDD funds. Um, so no, the answer is no. Um, if you're asking if we could do that, um, well, you know, I want to yes, so okay. I would like to do that. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's easy to do. We, we pretty much operate that way now anyway, but to get it in writing, uh, uh, I think to make it a formal policy, I think it's a great idea. Okay, last one. So as far as with what we're doing moving forward with the possible of these housing um, funds and things that we are trying to put in action for the TIP and the BDD, I mean, I feel like something needs to be in, we need to do something for that as well. Like, I think that we need to, these people need to be insured, licensed, like, I feel like that's gonna be a whole other ball game with this, so I don't know if that has to be in this ordinance or if we have to do something else for that. So I, I, I think we could, we could do that tonight if the council agrees. Uh, you're talking about the residential side? Yeah. Or, yeah. Well, that would be, that, that's a different, having um, contractors register with the village and provide a bond and insurance, that's a completely different matter and it, it's not, th this ordinance is directed only to TIF and BDD projects. But those would be TIF and BDD projects. So, I, th so I think she's, just this go ahead. On the residential end. Yeah, because yes. we are gonna be offering TIF and BDD funds. I would rather keep that separate because th there aren't really residential projects gonna be in the BDD. I th there is TIF and I, and I, I think we can get. Yes, BDD too includes residential. Okay. So I don't know if we do, like if we need to lay that out when we do those, like if we need to lay out those guidelines when we orchestrate how when we do the criteria for the housing I, program. I, I think moving forward, and we've already had one meeting on this housing program, but I do think there should be some quality control, so I do agree with that. But I think that would be the time to put that in place, be, um, be, unless council feels differently. No, no, I just think that um, if we're going to go down that road, I think it ought to apply to all residential construction. So we need to do that something different. That, that would be my recommendation. I mean, I don't think we have to. Uh, so I, 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 I'm following your reasoning. I, you're saying that any residential within the TIF itself is what you want to include. Well, if you are getting, ta if you are receiving tax dollars from TIF or BDD funds, I mm -hmm. feel like there should, there we have to have some kind of qualification on. That. I agree, and that that well, that, that, that is that this ordinance. Come. This does apply. This would to apply to any, whether it's residential or yeah. commercial. So it's covered. It's not restricted to commercial. But okay. I think maybe, if I may, Sarah might have been speaking to the expansion of TIF District Two and the private residences that we are hoping to um, help people add like another room or a bathroom and that sure. type of thing and that I don't know if that is seen as like a different type of a bird than what yeah, but it, it, to, so everybody is clear this would apply to that scenario okay because if you have a small house and you're gonna put, put an addition on it oh, and you're okay. asking for TIF funds this applies to all TIF projects okay, okay. Well, okay. Now, that clarifies that okay. Or okay then I'm good Thank okay you. Oh, perfect Thank you. Okay, so. Anyone else? Beth, you want to add anything else? No. Okay, you ready for the question? Yep. Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazam? Aye. Trustee Gett? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. All right, that passes. Next, Resolution 2019-11, a resolution of adoption of the Tri-County Multi-Jurisdictional Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan. Trustee Gett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, do I need to make a motion to accept this resolution? And a second, please. Second. All right, go ahead, Trustee Gett. Okay, uh, well, this is pretty much covers, it's a rant, or uh, an act that was, because, you know, we have severe wet winter storms and thunderstorms and natural disasters this is to cover to our jurisdiction. We do have a person from the Tri-County who could come up here and help. She could answer the questions better than me. And uh, Hi, Rima. It's, it's Welcome. to uh, help with when, when it happens, who gets what. 
go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Rima Abiyakar. I am with the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission, and um, I helped make this three-inch plan. <laughs> <laughs> we stopped measuring it in pages, and it's just inches now. Okay, does anybody got... You want to take that? Yeah, explain it. Okay, if you want to go ahead and explain sure. what's going on here with this. It's, yeah. You so wrote this, it all up. This is for the whole Tri-County area. Um, there's 15 jurisdictions that were part of this. Um, basically, the whole idea is to minimize loss, potential loss of life, potential uh, structural damages. Um, so having projects outlined in this plan uh, will allow the village to uh, submit um, applications for grants and things for uh, through IEMA or FEMA um, so that would relate to mitigation so of course if there were to be an actual hazard you could obviously always get funding for that but this is mitigation so in advance and this is to keep things from being bogged down and get quick response for all this yes uh, does anybody else have any questions for her or Done. Thank you, Rima, very much. Why don't you tell us just a little bit? You and I get to work together on Tri County. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Okay. Yeah. So Thank the Tri County, Thanks, the Tri County Regional Planning Commission um, is over Peoria, Tazewell, and Woodford counties, and we mainly do transportation planning, but we also do uh, land use planning, environmental issues. Thanks, Thomas. Basically, anything that could cover three counties. Um, so in this case, this is relevant um, because it could, you know, a tornado is not bounded by counties or cities or anything like that. Um, so this is just one of the many things that we do, and we come to meetings like this to show that we're doing all these things. <laughs> just a curiosity, I mean, how long did it take you to make that little portfolio? <laughs> this, we started in 2017, and we're just finally ending it. So this is the very last step, um, is just to get the okay from all of these jurisdictions. Um, and we have to do this every five years. Uh, and that's one other thing I'll say. So if the village has another suggestion for a project they'd like to include, we're going to send out an email in October and say, hey, we can um, amend the plan to add more. So there's yearly opportunities to add more. So basically, you're going to be starting over again anyhow, building for the next five yes. years. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your help and All your right. input. Thank and you. Your hard work. Thank okay, you. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk? Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazam? Aye. Trustee Gadd? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. All right, that passes. <clears throat> Next, approval of Ordinance 2019-1614, an ordinance regulating the use of the corner of Prospect and Cybeline for solicitation by not-for-profit organizations and providing for a penalty for violation. Trustee Gadd, it asks for a motion to approve that. I make a motion to approve it. And a second? Second. Okay, we've discussed this, discussed it, and discussed it. Uh, so we pretty much are uh, agreed to uh, what, four. We're going to allow four uh, people, four permits to uh, do fundraisers at the corners. Uh, anybody got any anything they want to change on this? I think it's we were limiting it to four and four. Um, Philanthropies that directly benefit the heights is what I thought the discussion. Right. Yes. Yeah. Local, okay. local, 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 yeah. Yeah. local charities. It's Correct. updated in section five. Okay. Saves that. I mean, I think it's a good idea that I mean that is a busy corner, and we should make sure it's heights. Any questions, Madam Clerk? Trustee Carter. Aye. Trustee Mariscal. Aye. Trustee Kazam. Aye. Trustee Weget. Aye. Trustee Weisenberg. Aye. Trustee Vork. Aye. All right, that passes. Next, approval of Ordinance 2019-1616, the annual tax levy for 2019-2020 for the village and the library. Trustee Get. I make a motion to approve Ordinance 2019-1616. And a second. second. Okay. This uh, is based. Let's get the uh, library piece out of the way. Sean Edwards, welcome. Just so there's any questions for Sean. 
And then we'll go back to you, Trustee Gett. How's that? That's all right. It's fine. Yeah, I'll just make a few brief comments, but uh, I just want to thank the, the village for providing such a, a, a great work environment. Um, we have a really great relationship with the village, and uh, it's always very nice to be able to call the village and uh, talk with someone, whether it be Dustin or Stephanie or the mayor, um, especially Public Works, uh, Dave, Mike. Um, we have a great relationship with everybody. Dave, I drink the water every day. It's great. It's, um, right out of the faucet, no filtering. It's, <laughs> works for me um, but uh, Mike and his crew um, they do uh, snow plowing for us uh, they did a great job this week I really appreciate that the lot is cleaned and I don't have to worry about that and anything but um, uh, it, it's just I don't know if you appreciate it it's just that the, the administration here just does a really great job and we really appreciate the uh, the relationship that we have with uh, the village and that's been established um, well, thank you for your kind words it's an honor to work with you you were lucky to have you in the community Sean and not only do you run the day-to-day -day operations of the library, you're very active in the community and other organizations, and I appreciate that, so thanks. Yeah, um, my staff has a lot of fun with uh, Halloween and the, uh, the trunk or treat, so as long as you keep that up and I can keep them involved, then we'll have some more <laughs> things to do. But um, too bad it didn't rain this year. You know, that was, that was yeah, not still bad, had a good but turnout, uh, they still though. had a good turnout, so that's nice. Um, and I don't want to go on about the library too much, but I just want to pose a few comments about library service and I mentioned before that, that this library is, is rather small but we have a very good staff and we seem to be well, very well appreciated by the community. Um, and we're always getting comments from people that come into the library who've never been in the library before and said wow I didn't know you had such a facility this is really nice. Um, so stop by, see the library sometimes, see what we're doing. Um, we have uh, grown a lot in some ways over the last few years. Um, people have, uh, in general, I won't say everyone, but a lot of people assume that the internet is wiped out and library service and that, you know, we're not there anymore, we're not doing a, a, a needed service. But in, in the last few years, we have grown probably in our circulation by about 5% every year. We, we circulate more than 50,000 items every year. Uh, every day, uh, our computers are used um, by probably 50 people. Uh, we have about 1,500 sessions a month on average uh, on our computers. Uh, our, our library is fine free. We don't charge fines for anything that uh, is kept a few days over. Uh, that's We're about the only library in this area that does that. Uh, it's not, it was never a major uh, source of revenue anyway, but it's very nice that, that people seem to appreciate that we're not chasing them down in the streets or, or hiring Conan the librarian to, to, he knows what I'm talking about, but uh, fans of UHF, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Um, uh, we have about 2,000 cardholders right now that are active. We, we purge those files on a regular basis, so we have a good base of, of patrons. We also get a phenomenal number of people that come from outside of this area that think we're Peoria Public Library, which we try to remind them that we are not, that once they cross into the township here, they're in the village of Peoria Heights, and we're the village library of Peoria Heights. We take great pride in recommend, and reminding people that uh, we, are, we are welcome um, to serve them, I mean, we're you know they're free to come to the library, but they still have to get their library card from Peoria Public. They're they're paying a different, you know, taxing body there. Um, one of the things that we've done really well in the last few years is uh, is children's services as as a growth area. Uh, the children's area has been phenomenal the last few years. We uh, I don't know exactly where all these people are coming from. Um, maybe they say it's millennials that are coming to the library now and that's, the, that's a big source of, of uh, our patron base. I don't know. But if they are, they're bringing their children because we have a lot of children activities these days. Um, we, we have about 10 different story hours throughout the month. We have uh, Makerspace, uh, Lego Robotics, uh, First Lego League like uh, St. Thomas was. Um, we have uh, uh, we have an uh, anime and manga club, uh, we have graphic novel book club, and they're all doing really well, they're, they're growing. Um, we've hired a, a second full-time person for our youth services department because we've got so many people that are coming into the library now for specifically children's services. Uh, our children's collection has grown um, 
uh, it seems exponentially. We've put a lot more money into it in the last few years. And right now, our, our circulation from where we were five years ago to where we are now for children's books is more or less doubled. It's gone from about 1,000 books to about 2,000 books or more. There's just children's books per month that we, that we do. Um, and so I, I'm very happy um, that that's happened. That's uh, a cause for, for yeah, re rejoicing for me just because I know that there are people, there's a, there's a patron base that's coming from somewhere that are they're much younger and they're being brought up in the library and they're getting used to the services and they're seeing the library on a regular basis and they're reading with their parents, they're reading with their families. So um, whatever happens to our, our little old ladies, the stereotypical library patron in the future, I don't know, but we have the kids that they're there to, 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 to be patrons for the next 50, 60 years, hopefully. So um, that's about all I want to say right now. Uh, if you have any questions, um, we do have um, a project coming up in the next, uh, in, in the spring. We're going to be working on the, the parking lot. And they um, have a, uh, I've been working with Maurer Stutz to uh, work on um, parking lot design. And we should be looking to finalize bids in February. So sometime next spring, hopefully we'll get that out of the road and we'll have a, more or less a new parking lot. We're adding a lot of spaces. We're adding some handicapped spots, restriping everything. Um, we've already put in some uh, safety lights in the, in the parking lot. I don't know if Mike noticed it when he was plowing. He probably got good lights on the, on the plows, but anyway, it helps with safety around the building. Um, we've got a bunch of just um, uh, mounted right on the wall lights for um, the sidewalks in the parking lot. It's, it's helped a lot. But. So we've got a lot of little projects like that that we're doing to, to improve the conditions around the library. And in, in the future, next year, we're looking at redoing some of the internal parts of the library, including the lighting, getting some Ameren credits to, to save on some lighting bills, um, redoing a lot of the paint. The, the library really hasn't seen any kind of major improvements for 20 years since it was opened. So we're hoping to start in, in the inside and get some things out of the road there, work on the roof. The roof has not been uh, really had any kind of attention in 20 years. We've done a little bit of patching, but we've got some areas that we need to work on and, and put some, some serious money into. So um, that's all I have. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. I have a feeling that people take today as being the internet's out there. Everybody can get the Well, there are some people who don't have the internet in their home. Mm -hmm. Have, and you provide them access by being open, come in there, they can mm -hmm. access the internet and uh, take advantage of it and learn a few other things too. So I really appreciate all your hard work. And I know you work on a shoestring budget, so. Well, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. Um, we've improved the Wi-Fi in the, in the library quite a bit over the last couple of years, and we've added some more access points within the building. Um, and it even creeps out into the parking lot a little bit. We get a lot of people that park in the lot, and they know exactly where to park so that they can stream their movies or whatever, <laughs> or download their stuff. Yeah. That's all right. We, we shut it off after the library closes. It's, you know, it's like, can't have everything. But, um, yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah, so you, do you have a board that determines what your annual uh, property tax increase is? Correct. I have Ann Lockhart back here tonight, so. Yeah, Ann's back here. She's one of the members, all right. So if, if they have a board that determines the amount, why do we have to vote on it? Because we, we don't vote on the school board increase, do we? No, but this is a, somewhat of a function of village government. The council would be better taking that question. It's just the way Illinois it, set up the... It, it is. There's, there are library districts in Illinois, but Peoria Heights doesn't have a library okay. district, so it is run under the umbrella of the village, but it is a, a separate governing board. So we levy as the village, but their board is the one that decides what the levy is going to be. I mean, you see this Ultimately, a lot of times in, in county government with health departments and right. uh, other right. other functions that are of uh, services that are provided to the citizens. But you'll have an elected board that oversees the policy, does the hiring, but the village sets the levy. Yeah, pretty okay. much. What do you say? <laughs> yeah. Th thank you, Sean. Uh, sure. Trustee thank Get, you. you want to get into the village piece then? Well, uh, Dustin, you want to take this? I'll, re I'll rely on our bookkeeper to oh, give, yeah. give an update on where we're at. <laughs> 
All right, so essentially what is the levy? Let me pull it up so that I have the numbers in front of me. Um, the village is keeping its portion for general corporates uh, flat like it has for the last more than 10 years and it is increasing the police pension funding uh, just underneath the 5% that the village is allowed to increase without holding a truth in taxation. Um, as we spoke about last time, this is going to help reduce the unfunded liability that the police pension has currently. Okay, uh, we still got a long ways to go on that though, right? The, a pension. very yes so i have we're still going uphill yes essentially the most recent report that i can recall i know there's another one that's going to be in my email here but i don't recall we're about 45 46 percent funded with the police pension fund so there is a very long road to go um i believe it's about 3.7 million dollars in unfunded liability that needs to be if, if we had the funds put in today um, and the unfunded liability essentially continues to grow the longer the uh, village continues to not fund it because there are interest payments that have to be made on the unfunded liability that basically just continue to accrue and expand because there's no money there to earn interest so we have to factor that in as well. So what happens um, Chief Sutton if police officers start retiring and there's not enough money there well it, under the state mandate we are responsible that is something that we are responsible for and I guess so like, that let's say you guys were all of age and you all just said I'm gonna retire yeah. tomorrow and the village would have to find another uh, funding source uh, to fund all those retirements and you know going back to the philosophy of past administrations that's that was a philosophy well I want you here two years and move on because of that reason right there that's why it wasn't funded for years but now that we've changed the landscape and the 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 approach to retention now we're looking at issues like this where we've had officers retire recently which in the past I think we've only had one and in the last three years we've had three so, just this last year you had two, two. Mm -hmm. so you know we've changed changed the mindset changed the landscape of you know the police department and retention and most of the officers have been with me you know get coming up on 20 years so now it is an issue we're a lot better than most police departments when it comes to pension but we're still way behind this is not just a Peoria Heights problem this is a national problem a state problem um, but we are better than we were but we have a long ways to go as yeah. Stephanie stated so you know the last few administrations have made strides in catching up with with our debt on the pension but we're still mm -hmm. when you start with <laughs> the Nothing. hole we were in you know it's uh, it's gonna take a while but it's a great question because you're exactly right uh, we're going to be faced with officers that are going to have the opportunity to retire in the next few years that are going to be of age and have their time on so uh, but the village ultimately is responsible so yeah. do we have any other ways that we can come up with some money to get even further on I'm this that that would be one option is if the board wanted to uh, understand that that might cause the general funds um, budget to be a little tighter next year uh, they could amend this levy and dedicate all of the property taxes to the police pension fund um, that would increase funding at hundred and twenty four thousand five hundred thirty three dollars um, which would be obviously a good step towards reducing that three point seven million dollars I think if we're are we, if we're in a position to do that why isn't that something that we're doing then um, just to, uh, I, like Chief Sutton said, I mean, if you he's got officers that have been working for him for 20 years, mm -hmm. and some of those are getting closer and closer to retirement, and we don't get this caught up, I don't see how we're ever going to get out of the hole. Right. So can we amend this tonight to put that 124 all into the police pension fund? I believe okay. so. That's taking 124,000 out of the general fund. Yeah, I, I yeah, think we one, one, I, I, I don't know if I want that, but one thing that I think we could do if we we end up the year with a surplus, the board could uh, have a policy to put any of that any or all or part of that surplus 
to the, towards the police pension. I think that would be so better. So that provides the board with more flexibility. By general corporate, you're allowed to spend on almost any public business. By retaining the general corporate portion of it, essentially that protects the village that we're going to continue to receive the revenues that we have right now, and we know that we are. If we need them, then they're available. If they're not, then um, we would have to find $124,000 elsewhere. But this way, if we need them, they're there. If we don't need them, the, the board can always vote to contribute additional funds to the police pension fund. And that way, at the end of the year, it can simply become um, possibly what the mayor's describing, and I think is a very good solution to this, is to have the board start making annual reviews in April as part of the budgeting process and say, all right, this is the projected surplus. We would like to make a transfer of X amount into the police pension fund in addition to start reducing the unfunded liability. Okay, so before we get to April, mm -hmm. um, is it possible, like, if we went back and looked at last year's budget, to start looking where we can start cutting some of this stuff so we have more of a surplus to put in there? I mean, are we going to have a lot of the same line items on? Well, the time for that would be when we approve the, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the next fiscal budget. The, this year's budget, I think what you're asking, this year's budget is coming along very well. If, if you're asking about where I would start cutting this year's budget, um, there, it was a pretty solid budget. There wasn't a lot of fluff in it, um, and I th a lot of what we're coming down to seeing uh, the surplus that we're going to have this year is down to unanticipated revenues, um, revenue line items outperforming what we anticipated, and essentially conservative fiscal planning. Um, you know, not not putting in a lot of wants and desires, but making sure that what we have and that what we need to spend is adequately budgeted for, and that we're we're making sure that some emergencies are covered as well. Um, and so we never should be spend, spending straight to a budget line item. We should always have some room in there that covers emergencies. And I think that what we're seeing is we had a reasonable budget and we're spending within our limits and so we're gonna have a surplus. I think also we should really look at being more aggressive about finding other ways to pay for some of these things in the budget, like I was speaking to Cheryl about the IDNR and some of the half a million dollar, one of the half a million mm -hmm. dollar grants for infrastructure and water. And if we went after something like that, it would alleviate some of the funding that we already have allocated in our current budget. Mm -hmm. Think, you know, ideas like that, I think are really very plausible. And then in the coming years, as the TIFs and the BDDs start to come online more and more, we're gonna be able to start spending some of those funds to help complete public infrastructure projects. Um, I mean, I know that this is a couple of months ahead of the time, but Mike Casey and I have already started talking with Alicia Herman about curbs and sidewalks and road programs, and I'm looking at it from a perspective of, okay, we need to do a lot of things, and we can use MFT for some of this, we can use general fund for some of this, and if we complete it within specific areas, we can also use BDD and TIF funds and other areas. So we're hoping to see some of these burdens start to alleviate, and as we do, we'll be able to use basically a variety of funds from a variety of places to hopefully address some of the problems, the majority of the problems, as quickly as we can, but it will all take time. Especially this one, a $3 million project, or that that's not going to get solved overnight. Essentially, mm -hmm. the way part of the problem, this problem, is that by underfunding for years, we lost out of years of in investment income. So it's going to take us some years to kind of work back up there and let the investment income work in our favor as well. I thought we were at a point, though, weren't we? Where we were able to get a more of a return back on the money? Yes. So we have, well, okay, so we have reached the point where by state law we are allowed to invest pretty fully. Um, it's about, it's just over 50% of the fund can be invested in high yield um, uh, interest, basically mutual funds. Um, that's going to change in the next three-ish years with the pension consolidation, but that's kind of a longer conversation that I will be talking to all of you about multiple times as that process kind of develops. Because right now we don't entirely know what consolidation is going to mean. Okay. Okay, any other questions or discussion on the levy? Yeah, Stephanie, so what is the surplus we're running currently? 
I don't know what it is currently. I know that when I reported to you as the uh, last half of the fiscal year, it was approximately 375,000 as of October. That's inflated. It includes, um, it includes sales tax revenues that are actually are dedicated to economic development agreements, but we don't make the transfers until later in the year, so that's inflated. Um, it also includes the fact that the first half of our fiscal year tends to be more profitable to us than the last half. So if you ask me to look at the first half of our fiscal year going back, I'm always going to tell you that things look better than they do by the end of the fiscal year. We know that, we acknowledge it, but we adjust down our expectations. Um, essentially, what I think I reported at the time was that an acknowledgement of I anticipate we're going to have a surplus higher than the approximately $150,000 that's budgeted, I would, we won't have a $380,000 surplus. We won't. Um, if we're doing well, approximately two hundred. dollars more likely probably about one seventy-five. dollars okay. So instead of raising property taxes on a lot of Heights residents who can't afford their bills now, we have a lot of people on fixed incomes. Why don't we take that 20, just shy of $24,000 out of the surplus instead of raising property taxes? Well, that would be a decision for the trustees, but um, the arguments against it essentially are, uh, the first thing that I can think of off the top of my head is that for those residents who um, can't afford their bills, there are actually the tax freezes that freeze their tax assessment, and so that helps with the affordability of their bills. Um, I think Mayor Phelan knows a little bit more about that and can speak to that. The second thing that I think of is essentially that the well, the village is in a position of it's starting to do well, um, and we are looking forward to enjoying a lot more success. We're still at a position of we haven't entirely recovered from all of the years where we weren't doing well. Um, we have a, a backlog of projects that just is is overwhelming to think about. Um, the curb and sidewalk program alone, which hasn't, I mean, we did one project in the entire time that I've been here. I've been here 10 years, and that project was almost $100,000. So starting to not only complete curb and sidewalks, but go back and repair all the ones that haven't been repaired over the last 10 years that should have been, while we might have a surplus, and I know that to, to people, they look at that surplus and think, okay, well, you have that extra money. Why are you raising my taxes? We're doing it because we need to start increasing the reserves so that we can fund larger projects. Um, that $100,000 surplus is essentially going to get eaten up by the curbs and sidewalks alone, and that doesn't address the underfunding of the police pension. It doesn't address the roads or any of the other projects that I know that the board would like to consider. It, so. That's why um, I have made the recommendation, and Chief Sutton also has made the recommendation to increase the property taxes. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the families in our village aren't doing as good as the village. Their incomes have not increased. Um, so we continue to ask the citizens of Peoria Heights for more and more money via taxation. When we're running surpluses, they are not running surpluses. So I think it's a, a bit much to sit and ask people who aren't running surpluses to contribute more taxes when their investments in our business district are, are running surpluses. 65% um, of our students in our community school are either at or below the poverty level. Asking those families to contribute more money in taxes is almost shameful, especially when we're running surpluses. Um, I know it was mentioned once that it was just pennies, um, but if I had a penny for every time that a state and local body told me it was only pennies, I'd have the high taxes we have today in Illinois. Um, so I think we should really look at this and instead of raising property taxes, actually use the revenue from the investments we've made to not raise people's taxes. Um, the houses in the Heights have lost value and yet we're increasing property taxes. That's a lose-lose for the, our citizens in Peoria Heights. Um, so before we raise their taxes more, they're already contributing $354,000 to this police pension. What shame would it be to take $23,000 out of our surplus to pay towards the police pension? Um, and the reason we arrived at that $23,000, because it's the, the highest amount we can raise 
without having a public meeting about it. So I think transparency wise, I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, I would prefer a public meeting anytime we increase property taxes because I think we're having one right now. This is a public meeting. A public no a notice that goes out to the citizens. On the agenda. Yeah, but when you say levy, a lot of people don't understand what levy means. Um, but when you say property tax increases, that enlists a different emotional response to that. Um, so I would just encourage the board to take the revenue and the increases and the surpluses the people have made with their investments instead of raising their property taxes. Well, I would like to hold off on just taking the surplus out of there right now. I'd kind of like to hold back and see how we are, what we talked about earlier about waiting and see where we're at and what kind of surplus we have to uh, address that issue. So, uh, anybody else? So you don't want to vote on this tonight then? You I'd wait and see. Will you be having a we don't, don't collect choice. anything. We, we absolutely have to vote on I this tonight. I can vote on this. I just don't want to take money out of the surpluses and, and I don't want to mess with it. I want to vote I, on it as is. I think Trustee Gett was referring to holding off on putting the bulk into the police pension that we were discussing earlier. I think so, mm -hmm. that's what he was referring to. Right. Yeah, he wanted to wait and see what our revenues are at the end of the year. So it's two different things. Well, an amendment is always in order, but we have before us tonight to approve a levy of a specific amount. So I would like to amend that to levy the amount we levied last year, eliminating the property tax increase. And you want, you're making that? I'm making that motion. I would like, I move to amend the ordinance to the previous year's levy of 478,799. 478,799? Yep. And right. that would eliminate a property tax increase. With 124,533 to general corporate and I'll math out the other one for police pension. Is that what you're wanting? That would be 354,266 to police pension. Is there a second to the amendment? I need to understand that. What? So what you're going to do is there will be no levy? No. No tax increase? We will levy for what we levied yeah. last year. No tax increase. And then that would leave us how much that we'd have to come well, up with? Well, I think uh, you're, you're, it's not really a tax It could be a tax increase. It depends upon what your EAV is and how that all unfolds through the tax process. So right. Just to be clear, the levy amount it, is not That's the difference between a tax... Right. Yeah. If big your difference. house was, was assessed at $100,000 last year and now it's ninety, and the levy stays the same, your taxes are going up. I'm sorry. Going down. Down. <laughs> they, they could go up, they could go down. It depends upon the equalized assessed valuation of that property. So how do we ensure that we do not increase property taxes? You, I guess we you, cannot. Is, it's not you possible to do that calculation. Even if we keep it exactly the same and your property value went up, you're paying more in property taxes whether we take this, we ask for $24,000 or not. That's all based through the county on when they assess your property taxes. And I understand what you're trying to do and it's it's a noble cause, but you, you brought up multiple issues, um, especially with the poverty rate within the school. And I would suspect that most of those families are renting properties, not owning properties. But th this is this is simply approving a levy and we can't guarantee that we pass on a, um, whether we maintain the current tax level on that property or, or decrease it. So if there's a whole very complicated tax process that occurs and also see, uh, there are things like the senior freeze and homestead exemption that are put on properties for senior citizens. There are properties in, in this village that are paying no taxes, maybe a hundred or two hundred dollars in property taxes. So it, it's really uh, middle class and uh, homeowners that are, are really paying the property taxes, we're getting a nickel of the property tax bite. So for every dollar you pay in taxes, we get about a nickel. If you want to have a conversation about increasing tax rates, we should be talking to the other public bodies who pay, take a huge chunk of the property taxes. So all of this development that we, we talk about is important to those working families and those people who are having a hard time getting by because for everybody who comes up here and spends money on sales tax, that's less we have to levy for. That's less property tax that, that they have to pay. So 
everybody coming to Peoria Heights from outside of Peoria Heights, they're really funding the police department. They're really funding the public works department. And the people who live here that enjoy good services about snow plowing and police protection and water service, that's being paid by sales tax, not property tax. So that's where we, we sit on all this. And do we have the ability to change those percentages on the um, it's tax bills? We, no. No. Um, we, it's done by the county. We, we levy a specific dollar value. The county determines what the assessed value of property across the mm -hmm. uh, village is. And of course, some property values go down and some go up. It's, it's not possible to, to levy in, in, in a way that would keep everybody's tax bill from changing. You know, we could levy less money than we levied last year and somebody's tax bill is gonna go up because their assessed value went up. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it, we, all we control is the, the actual dollar uh, amount of our levy. And it, it, so what I, I understand Trustee Weisenberg is suggesting is let's keep that number the same as it was last year, but that doesn't mean that everybody's Village of Peoria Heights component of their tax bill is going to stay the same. Some people's may stay the same, some are gonna go up and some will go down based on the assessed value of their property. I think everybody's doing this, right? So like ICC does this, the Peoria Park District does this, yes. we do this, everybody applies for it and then they kind of determine when all this gets in, even though we're levying for this, they determine who's getting what percentage of what your property is. So what they do is they look, they take all the governing bodies requested levy, mm -hmm. and then they add that up. They then take the assessor's evaluations of all the properties, and then they run it through an equation that say, okay, in order to get you the amount that you assessed, we need to charge these tax rates, and then they apply those. And then what happens from there is what we levy isn't actually what we get because what happens is people protest their taxes or don't pay their taxes or any amount, all sorts of adjustments happen throughout the year. So we levy a certain amount, we don't get that, we get close to it. And then the following year, we're allowed to levy based off of what we received. Okay. Yeah, so a good point, just because we levy a certain amount doesn't mean we're gonna collect all of that. All right, I, I'm asking again, uh, Trustee Mariscal, did you want to uh, second the amendment? Can I withdraw that amendment? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, just, Can't. my goal was to reduce the amount of property taxes, but it seems like that is not. I yeah. applaud that, I share that right. concern. Right. I'm with you, 100%. Right, but it seems like that is not That's within really our power. That's really kind of up to the county, right? Yeah. Uh, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if they're the ones doing the assessing of the properties. Mm -hmm. We have no, no say so over Township that. assessor does that. Township. Township assessor. I, uh, let's all work together to keep running a very efficient government here and you know keep the economy humming along. When we drill down deep into um, the comprehensive plan for the village, I think we should be talking about things like that. You know, um, I, I know in talking with some of the realtors, uh, the price of homes in Peoria Heights are increasing. So when the assessor does the appraisals of properties, a big part of that um, um, formula is based on uh, comparables and what uh, other properties are selling for. So that also increases the EAV within the area. I'm, I'm but with you 100%, we gotta keep property taxes low in Peoria Heights because we have one of the highest rates, if not the highest rate in all of Peoria County when it comes to property taxes, and I believe that's hurt us. It, it's hurt us in our growth, but it, it, it does. It hurts, it hurts families, especially working families, who are struggling to pay that tax bill. But you know, I can assure you the village is taking a tiny, tiny bite of that, and I invite everyone, you'll be getting those within the next couple of months, those bills, take a look at that bill and see what you know what we're charging and the services we're providing but having that conversation you know as, as the budget evolves is all very important trustee Weisberg so I I think we're all in agreement on what you want to do your your amendment I don't think accomplishes that right I agree that's why I've withdrawn it okay any other discussion on the levy all right, Madam Clerk. Trustee Carter. Aye. Trustee Mariscal. Aye. Trustee Kazam. Aye. Trustee Gett. Aye. Trustee Weisenberg. Aye. Trustee DeVore. Aye. 
Yeah, all right, thank you everyone. So please, we had a good discussion on this. Let's keep talking about it as we move forward. Um, next is the approval of Katie's Cars Annual Special Use Permit. Trustee Gettit asked for a motion to approve that. Sorry. that? Sorry. A motion to approve the Katie's car. Oh, yes. I make a motion to approve Katie's car's special use permit. And a second, please. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, Katie's car is down there on uh, 29. Or anyhow, uh, they've been in business for a long time. They have a used car sales lot. Uh, they meet there all the criteria. Uh, I don't have any complaints about them. Do you, Dustin? No, uh, in your packet is Officer Brackney's uh, report submitted uh, December 11th of this year. Uh, they are in compliance, so. So, okay. Any discussion? Madam Clerk? Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazam? Aye. Trustee Gatt? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. All right, that passes, thank you. Lastly is approval of ordinance 2019-1608, an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the village of Peoria Heights regarding adults, adult use recreational cannabis businesses. Trustee DeVore to ask for a motion to approve that. I make a motion to approve ordinance 2019-1608. In a second, please. Second. All right. Go ahead, Trustee DeVore. Um, this is the same ordinance that we've been discussing as far as recreational use cannabis. After our last meeting, we asked it to be changed to mirror our alcohol requirements. So in the um, ordinance in front of you, it has moved the location to within 100 feet of a school or church and that we would allow in we would allow a business to, to reside within B1 and B2 um, moving forward. So unless we have changes or questions on that, we would just be moving forward with everything we've already discussed with it. The, and from what, just a quick clarification, if we want, I, I made the change to eliminate the restriction to the War Memorial Corridor, oh, okay. but I did not add B1 Central Business District. If that's what we want, it's a real simple fix. Um, but I, I must have missed that. So you want to admit, if it's... That would take the will of the board. We would amend the main motion. Is that correct? But this, but as it's as it's written, it would allow for B one or B two. No, no, only B two. Oh, okay. I would just like to leave make it a comment. I would like to leave it this way because I know we had discussion about this at the last meeting, and Trustee Weisenberg brought this up. But I would like to. Um, alert all of our fellow trustees to the comments that Kathy made this evening and there are reasons we had come to that decision in the beginning and a lot of it has to do with parking, traffic, that type of issue as well. And when these people come and apply and come in front of us, we could amend it for that particular use. Is that right? You, yeah, so it can be amended at any time. So I, I like the way this reads. Council, we can also amend it the other way. We can amend it the other yeah. way, but I'm just, you so know, if I just it's in there, and they come, we can always say no. We don't have to say yes, correct? Correct. No. That, that's why we have the special use process, is just for that reason, so we can deal with applications on, on a site-by-site -site basis. Yeah. Council, right. I thought that what we were voting on today was what we discussed last meeting. If we want to change it to eliminate the, uh, to account for what Ms. Stevenson said, that's fine, but I think we should, the yeah, I, we have now should reflect what we discussed. I, I just meeting. misunderstood what, what I was supposed to change. I, I thought the, the idea was to eliminate the restriction to the War Memorial Corridor, not to add a new zoning district. Well, I, I was under the impression that we were adding. Adding. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and a, I, would, I welcome an amendment at any time from any, yeah. <laughs> any, any opinion. That's, that's my fault. What's in front of you does not include B1 Central Business District, so it would require, um, it would require an amendment. And then I and I can make that fix, but that's that's why we discussed these. Um, I, I just didn't catch so we make, that was the change I was supposed to make. We make the amendment. We can always change it in the future. Of I I make the motion to add that. Make that motion to add that amendment. And, and the amendment is to add the B one Central Business District as a district that cannabis dispensing organizations will be allowed in. And I second it. So the amendment is to have the actual ordinance that we discussed the last meeting yes. here. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. And I we want to amend it to go to further restrict it 
that would be an additional amendment onto this amendment because what we discussed was allowing it in B1 or B2. And that's what we should have been voting on tonight. It, it, exactly, except I didn't catch that. No, I, 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 I just, it's my mistake. No, I get that. But so. the document in front of you does not have B1 in it. I understand. So would you like to offer an amendment, Trustee Weisenberg? I already I did. did. Jeff did. Okay. He seconded it. Oh, all right. So on the amendment, Madam Clerk, would you repeat the amendment? Yes, just a moment. <laughs> All right. I currently have the amendment as uh, to allow B1 Central Business District as an allowed district for distribution of cannabis. Would that be cannabis dispensing Can organizations? Okay. Correct. Okay. So on the amendment. It's not an amendment. It's Any discussion? Um, yes, so just for those following at home, because I don't think the last meeting was recorded, um, what we discussed was mirroring the alcohol ordinances and zoning with the marijuana or the cannabis ordinances. Both drugs, and instead of injecting personal bias into whether you think cannabis should be consumed or shouldn't be consumed, we are mirroring the ordinance with the ordinance we already had in place for alcohol consumption. Correct. Okay, any discussion? In, in terms of the location of Safe. licensed facilities right. in, in conjunction with churches, schools, and daycares. Correct. Okay. And Kathy had said something, and I didn't quite understand what she said, something about on-site consumption. She said that the alcohol wasn't consumed on site. Was. Can was. be. Can be. Yeah. So she's concerned that people are going to be smoking marijuana right. on site at some point in the future. Right. That's not. I just want to be change. clear that my objection to this doesn't have to do with personal, personal opinion about cannabis. It has to do with a traffic issue. And we have more congestion in this part of our community than we do in other districts. That's my only comment on this. It's. It's not whether or not you want to participate in either alcohol, you know, alcohol or cannabis. As far as what you're asking with Kathy, so right now, correct me if I'm wrong, they're stating that even if we, the state allows licenses for consumption of cannabis, it's not going to be allowed in a dispensary. It's going to be a whole separate entity. So like you would have like a bar, essentially like a cannabis bar that will be allowed for consumption, but still inside the dispensaries, they're not going to be Correct. allowed to consume. Yeah, I understand. Even moving forward. Right. Just to clarify. Anyone else on the amendment? All right, Madam Clerk, call the roll on the amendment. All right, this is to vote on the amendment to add B1 Central District. Trustee Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazam? Nay. Trustee Gett? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Nay. All right, that does pass with two objections. So back to the main motion as amended. Madam Clerk, call the roll on that. Just a moment, please. When you're ready. Trustee, this is on the um, uh, the ordinance as amended, so it will include B1 Central um, Business can you District. Read the whole ordinance, then. I'm sorry, just so I'm clear on my voting. Yes. Okay. So this is on ordinance number 2019-1608, an ordinance amending the zoning ordinance of the Village of Peoria Heights regarding adult use recreational cannabis businesses. It has been amended to allow B1 Central Business District as an allowed district for cannabis dispensing businesses. Trustee Carter. I'm so confused right now. I don't know which way I'm going to be voting. We so voted. What are we doing this for? We're voting on the ordinance as amended. Okay, as to the to way it should have been. So right. it's well, well right. the way the board so decided to change it. B1, and you're also including the distance between schools and churches. That's Correct. The, that's okay. the other thing. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. Aye. Trustee Mariscal. Aye. Trustee Kazam. Aye. Trustee Gett? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. All right, that passes. All right, we'll be at the Treasurer's Report. Madam Clerk? Okay, as of the end of November, in the village controlled accounts, there was $2,670,260.27. And in the water controlled accounts, there was $997,226.86. I would ask for a motion to approve the treasurer's report. Make a motion to approve. 
Do I have a second? Okay, Trustee Kazam made a motion and Trustee DeVore seconded, if that's okay. okay. Any discussion on the motion? Madam Clerk? Trustee Hello. Carter? Aye. Trustee Mariscal? Aye. Trustee Kazam? Aye. Trustee Gatt? Aye. Trustee Weisenberg? Aye. Trustee DeVore? Aye. All right, with no further business coming before the board, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and safe travels in your holidays. Uh, Trustee Gett? I make a motion to adjourn and Merry Christmas. Do I have a second? Second. All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, we're adjourned. Yeah.